Thanks for watching this week's sermon from Community Church. As a reminder, like and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And you can always contribute to what we're doing at cefchurch.com slash give. Man, good morning to you all. What a great song about the trustworthiness of God. Amen. You know, I love that song when it talks about we've all been there, right? We've all been there when we thought God wasn't going to show up. And then he does. And then we're thankful. And then another situation comes and we don't think God's going to show up, but then He does. He makes a way where there was no way. He does it again and again. And so I just want to pray for us this morning. I don't know where you're at if you're in one of those times where you're waiting for God to show up. Or maybe you don't think God's going to show up this time. Well, I want to pray for you this morning. Regardless of where we find ourselves, God is trustworthy. Amen? God shows up, not in my time, but in His time. So Father, here we are, just a group of people that have worked all week, a group of people who have tended to their children, a group of people who've taken their kids to soccer practice, helped them with their homework, a group of people who babysat their grandkids throughout the course of the week. Father, a group of people who have had ups and maybe more downs this week than we would like. Father, we're a group of people that find ourselves in the midst of health issues. A group of people that find ourselves in the midst of financial issues. A group of people that find ourselves in the middle of relational issues. So God, I ask right now that we might feel the embrace of your arms. Father, right now that we can have comfort and peace in our heart because we know that you're aware of our situation. Father, we know that when we pray that you lean towards us, that your listening ear is ever open. And so God, this morning, for the folks here in this building that are struggling, whatever way that is, God, let them know God, give them confidence that you will make a way. Let them know, God, that you are there. Let them know, God, that you are the all-powerful God who directs kings and queens, that you're the God that rises the sun in the east and sets it in the west. You're the God that blows the wind, the God that makes the skies gray and hazy. You're also the God that brings joy and happiness into the lives of your people. So today, God, thank you for that. Remind us, God, give us confidence of the truth that we find in your word. God, give us confidence that you love us so very much and that, God, you always, always, always work for our best interests. So, God, we say thank you for that. God, we ask that you would bless the other churches in our community now as they gather at this 9 o'clock hour. Father, that you would bless those Christians in those other churches. God, remind us that we stand together. We stand arm in arm with our fellow Christians from every gospel preaching and Bible-believing church here in our community. So God, we ask all this now in the name of your son Jesus the name that is greater than any name in heaven and earth, the glorious, majestic name of the Son of God Himself, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. Good morning. How are we doing? Well, just a couple announcements before we get going. Uh, Wednesday, uh, uh, Lent begins, and that's the 40-day lead-in to Easter. And that's kind of a a somber time. We'll be talking a little bit about that next week. But if you want to be reading along in our little uh, Easter, our Linton devotional, it's out there at the lobby. It's $3. Pick that up. And then also the Daily Bread's out there for the new quarter. That's free. So again, avail yourself to some good devotional reading. 
be talking about devotional reading in a few minutes versus Bible study. So uh, anyway, pick those two up on your way out. And um, so by way of review, you know where we're at. We are in a series called Faith Blocks. And this is the final sermon on the second faith block, which is Bible study. Bible study. Um, why are we reinforcing these basic aspects, these foundational aspects of the Christian life? And again, I'll repeat it as we've done every week. When our faith walk is at its best collectively, not when the leadership is doing well, not when the youth group is doing well, not when uh, the, you know, the women's ministry is doing well, not when the men's ministry, when we all collectively who are called community church, when our faith walk is at its very best, then you and I, this group of people, have the greatest opportunity for maximum kingdom impact. Well, what does that mean, Pastor Rick? It simply means this, that we can convey the story of Jesus, the message of the cross, that we can build bridges to people that don't yet know Jesus, that we can minister to the least of these, the lost, the broken, the things that we do as a church following in the works of Jesus. We get maximum impact because all of us, are at our spiritual best. If you go to the self-help section of many bookstores, it talks about how to live a maximum life. Or if you're a golfer, how to get the maximum yards for your golf swing. Because everybody wants the maximum. Because God created us to live fulfilling lives. Jesus lived a maximum life, didn't he? I mean, Jesus, it was full. Every single day of his life was full. So, we want to have maximum kingdom impact. And here's the reason. Is that a church-going mentality doesn't do much for the community. Church-going mentality doesn't do much for you. Church-going mentality diminishes the impact of God's kingdom people. So what we are interested in is a vibrant kingdom faith. And we want a vibrant kingdom faith because the church of Jesus Christ cannot afford to have its members living nominal commitment in their lives. We don't want to follow Jesus with a ball and chain around our ankles. We want to follow Jesus at a full sprint, at a full run. We want to do all that we can. The message of the cross, the message of Jesus, is far too important for us to just live lives of church-going mentality. Every day in this community, people are passing through this life without knowing Jesus as their Savior. We were left to do something, yes? We were left here for a reason, yes? yes? I hope you know that God left you here after you became a Christian for a reason. And that is to proclaim the message, to live out a vibrant kingdom faith, and run after the things of Jesus as fast as you can, having a maximum kingdom impact. You know those things. We've been talking about them. We've also been talking about Bible study for the last few weeks, not home group on Tuesday night, not Thursday's Bible study for the ladies, not Monday night Bible study for the men. What we've been talking about is you and me taking out a Bible with our reading glasses, a cup of coffee, of hot tea, with a notebook, and we sit down and we look at the truths of God's Word, and we ask these questions of observation who's it written to what are they saying where's other stories in the bible that that we can correlate with this and then make application you see it's what each of us should be doing to feed ourselves amen because you all know how to do that physically right 
And what do you do with your kids and grandkids? You feed them until when? They can do it themselves. So if you come to church and you rely on me feeding you for a few minutes on Sunday, you'll starve if you wait till next Sunday. Amen? You understand that principle? You understand the need for you. You understand the need for you to do Bible study. You see, each week I share with you what I've gotten. I wanted to bring up three books just for your own personal study. Um, also remember, too, when you use the study Bible, which is right there in the middle, it has these amazing notes. Again, don't rely on the notes to tell you everything you need. Rely on the Holy Spirit. I had two conversations this morning. I had one with a, a man who just bought a study Bible this week. And you know what he told me? How have we ever read the Bible without a study Bible? Beautiful. That means some things have opened up to him. But again, here's the caution. As you read the Bible, you can trust God to show you stuff. That leads to a conversation I had with another man. He was asking me, you remember last week I was real uh, emphatic about the hidden secrets in the Bible, how that stuff doesn't exist, right? Well, he said, well, sometimes when I read Scripture, it's the same Scripture I've read before, but God shows me something new in those verses. I said, those aren't hidden things. Those are just, that's just the work of God because we can never exhaust this book. You can read John 3, 16 a hundred times and a hundred times, depending on where you're at in your spiritual walk, depending on what's happening in your life circumstances, you may get a different thing out of that verse a hundred different times. You can't exhaust scripture. That's why when somebody says, oh, we're studying judges again, I already studied judges. Really? Well, maybe this time God's really got something good in store for you in the book of Judges. But because you know it all, you won't get to read it. You won't get to see it. So anyway, uh, living by the book, that was Howard Hendricks. This is, a, 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 this is a, um, just one of the standard books on Bible study. They've been using this in Bible colleges for decades. Howard Hendricks was kind of the first guy to create this, this observation, interpretation, correlation, and application. It's, it's just a, a great book on, on Bible study, living by the book, how to study the Bible. Uh, I already talked about the uh, uh, study Bible there. And then this one is called Rick Warren's Bible Study Methods. Um, if you're not a fan of Rick Warren, don't worry about it. But he gives you seven different ways to study the Bible. A character study, a word study, a book study. So there's seven different ways that you can study the Bible. All three of those are good resources. But again, if you do anything, read the Bible yourself. Get a pencil and a paper. Let those things, let God speak to you. So today, um, we are going to put it all together, hopefully, hopefully. And um, uh, again, let me remind you, Bible reading is good and Bible reading makes you familiar with the Bible. But Bible study is when you engage the text. Bible study is when you grab a hold of it. And so today we're going to put it all together, uh, what we've been looking at for the last few weeks. So I hope it's going to make sense to you. I hope you brought your Bible, but if you didn't and you need a Bible, raise your hand. Fellows will bring you one. If you don't own a Bible, you keep this. This is yours. You read it, study it during the week. You bring it back next week. So if you need a Bible, raise your hand. No stigma attached. Just raise your hand, get your Bible, get your iPad, whatever you got there, to uh, uh, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, we're going to look at a number of verses this morning. I believe they're all important. I want to do them justice, but um, we'll see how time goes. So basically, let's begin with why personal Bible study. Well, Pastor Rick, you started with that at week one. Well, we didn't start there at week one because we wanted to talk about the trustworthiness of God's Word. Why you, can, why you can trust what you are studying. But today I want to talk a little bit about Bible study. And you know what I want to use to prove my points? I want to use the Bible. Isn't that, isn't that nice? That, see, that's me connecting the dots. And I get proud when I figure things out. Not in a proud way, but in a self-satisfying way. So let's think out loud for a few minutes. Why personal Bible study? Colossians, if you're there, chapter 3, look at verse 16. Colossians 3, verse 16. 
Paul says this to the church at Colossae. He, this is a letter that he wrote to a group of Christians that lived in Asia Minor in a city called Colossae. And you know what he told those Christians? Let the words about Christ, let the word of God, let the things of Jesus in all of its richness. Do you see what's added there? It's just not the words of Christ. But let the words of Christ in all of its richness fill your lives. You see that as a command? You see that as something that we ought to take to heart? Let the words, the story, the message that we find in these 66 books, let the stories, the words of Christ fill your lives. You remember last week, we looked at the words of Jesus, and Jesus said that when you read Scripture, it points to me. Old Testament points to a coming Messiah. New Testament talks about the Messiah that came, Jesus Christ. So let the Bible fill you with all of its richness. And when it does, when the Bible is in here, then you can teach and counsel each other with wisdom. You want to teach and counsel people with wisdom? Read this book, study this book, study this book. Then what Paul tells us is that you can teach and counsel each other with wisdom. You can teach and counsel with the wisdom that he gives, that God gives. And when your life is full with the message of Christ, you can sing psalms, you can sing hymns, and you can sing spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And so what I kind of get there is that if we aren't reading and studying and embracing the truth of God, it's very hard to sing songs about God when we haven't embraced the truth about God. So, for this to happen, this verse here, we just can't be familiar with the things of the Bible. We must know it inside out. Paul says, let it fill your life. Is that what Paul says? Underline, circle, highlight. Write in your Bible. Mark that bad boy up. Put an exclamation point there. This is what I should do and put an arrow. Fill your lives with the teachings and the message of Jesus Christ. Secondly, another benefit to studying Scripture comes from Psalm 119. Turn to Psalm 119. That's in the middle of your Bible. Flip your pages over because I want you to write in your Bible again. Get your marker out, get your pen out, whatever you have there. Another benefit of studying Scripture comes from Psalm 119, verse 11. I have hidden your word in my heart. Okay, what's the value of hiding this word, these stories, in my heart? When I hide them in my heart, I won't sin against you. See the value of Bible study? See the value of Bible memorization? The more familiar you are with the teachings of this book, the more on the straight and narrow you stay. I've hidden your word in my heart so that I won't sin against you, God. The study of Scripture keeps us out of trouble. I guarantee you, I can probably prove to you that most Christians who find themselves in hot water in their lives are not Christians that follow the teachings of Scripture. Because that's just what it says. That's what, hide your God's word in your heart so that you won't do stupid things. You see, remember when Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, Satan came to tempt him. And Satan says, well, you see all this stuff down here? I'll give this to you if you just bow down and worship me. Do you remember what Jesus argued with Satan? What did he use to push back Satan? Tell me the word. What did he say? What? Scripture! Jesus himself, when he was tempted by Satan to go astray, to take a wrong direction, Jesus himself defended himself against the words of Satan with Scripture. So if Jesus uses Scripture to keep the evil one away from being misdirected and distracted, how much more should you and I use the truth of Scripture to keep Satan away from us? I've hidden your word in my heart. Now underline, circle, and highlight so that I won't sin against you. You see the reason for Bible study? You see what God how God asks us to defend ourselves 
by knowing the truth of Scripture. Keep going, drop down to verse 18 in Psalm 119. Verse 18 of Psalm 19. Here's another benefit to Bible study. Another benefit to Bible study. Open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your law. Open my eyes so that I can see the truths that's in your word. <laughs> Some people look at Scripture, they read Scripture, they get up from the table, they come back to the Bible, and they read the same verse again because they don't even know what they read five minutes ago. God, you got to open my eyes here. You see, there's an aspect to Bible study that is a Holy Spirit thing. We read in John 16, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will illuminate you. That the Holy Spirit will cause you to see things that you can't see in and of yourself. So when we say, open our eyes, God, open my eyes to see the truth that's here. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's a God thing. God, open my eyes to the truth. Let me see what I need to see today. Let me see the truth that I need for today. Open my eyes also means this. God, give me a receptive heart to your word. God, let me have an open mind to your word. God, let me be teachable. Even when I don't like what it says. You ever run into those verses? There's more verses in there. I, there's a lot of verses I don't care for in the Bible. They're the verses that step on my free will. They're the verses that try to keep me in check. When my man, the, the old man inside of me, wants to do this, I read this in the Bible and it tells me to do that. You see? Even when I don't like what Scripture says, God, open my eyes to it. God, help my heart to be open to it. After all, this is for my own good, right? Let me give you one more benefit from Psalm 119. Drop down to verse 105. Psalm 119, 105. You familiar with these verses? Did you know they were all in one chapter? Some of you are sitting there going, wow, I know all these verses. Yeah, they're in the same chapter in the book of Psalms. Write that down in your notes. Read this chapter again. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word, this, these 66 books, your word, God, is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. No one likes to walk in darkness. You can't see the road ahead of you. You can make missteps. You can stumble. You can run into things. You can walk off the cliff in the dark. Psalm 119 tells us that the truth of this book, the principles found in this book, that they will be a lamp for your path. That they will give you direction. They will, the words in this book will illuminate the proper path for you and I to take. So if you're sitting there this morning saying, man, I'd like, to change my, I'd like to change the way I'm going. I'd like to change my life. Well, then take the principles from this book, apply them to your life, and I guarantee you in a few, few weeks you'll be heading the right direction. It says, your word is a lamp to guide my feet, your light uh, and a light for my path. But God's word will never steer you wrong but there's things we do as Christians that hinder us walking the right direction. This book is trustworthy. We've established that week after week. So why do many Christians trust what the culture tells us rather than what God tells us? You ever fall into that category? You trust what the culture says versus what God says. Well, we should be accepting to everyone and God loves everyone and however you are, that's the way God made you. That's what culture says. Now, I could take that advice. I could filter that into my life and begin like that's what I believe. Or I can let this book light my path. I can let this book be a light for my feet. And I would come to understand and know that I cannot trust what the culture tells me. I can't trust 
CNN. I can't trust Fox. I can't trust National Public Radio. I can't trust the BBC. Who and what can I trust? The truths found in this Bible. And when these truths bump up against the truths in the world, I choose these truths. Why do we trust the culture? Second thing that we do as Christians is we choose tradition over the teachings of the Bible. Now, this was the problem with the Pharisees, and Jesus called them on it in Matthew 7 and in uh, Mark 7 and Matthew 15. Jesus said, You ignore the teachings of the law in order to hold to your man made traditions. How many of us still hold on to church traditions from our childhood rather than follow the truth of Scripture? Many of us still do that. We choose tradition over the Bible. Well, I don't know why that woman wears so much makeup. Huh. In, in our day, we called her a Jezebel. Church tradition. How, how many of you grew up in a church where dangly earrings were forbidden? Ooh, those darn dangly earrings. Oh, my goodness. Look at that loose woman with those dangly earrings. <laughs> Church tradition. We choose tradition over the truth of Scripture. Oh, yeah, but Pastor Rick, don't you remember that verse about a woman's beauty should come? I, I, yes, yes, I know that verse. A woman's beauty should be from the inside. But some of them need some help, too, on the outside. <laughs> so, uh, no, I... I I take that back. That was not in my notes. All you ladies are beautiful. You're all beautiful. Okay. Thirdly, what do we do as Christians rather than use the truth of God's word is that we rely on human reasoning and everyone's else's advice. Rather than take the words of this book, we rely on human reasoning and everyone else's advice. How many times you ever heard a Christian say, well, Dr. Phil said. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Phil. That's who I turn to for all of my ethical advice in life. We rely on human reasoning. We ask other people. We ask other people instead of sitting down with this book. You know what we read in, 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 in Proverbs 16, 25? It says, there is a path before each person that seems right but in the end it's death so what does that tell you about human reasoning not so good don't follow that there's a way that seems right to man but in the end it's death so don't use human advice use the advice of this book and then lastly rather than trust god's word read and do what god's word says is that many christians trust their emotions <laughs> oh man if i had a dollar for every young man or young woman that sat in my office and said oh but i know they're hard they're, i know they're not a christian but i just love them I, I just feel i'm so deeply in love you know what this morning i was hungry but it passed <laughs> so if you're deeply in love with an unsaved person it'll pass Judges 21, 25. In those days, Israel had no king. So all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. That's your emotions. Doing what seems right in your own eyes. Oh, I, I feel like I should do this, or, or I feel that way, or, or I, uh, emotions come and go. Yes, they're God-given. Yes, they're wonderful things. But emotions can also mislead us and misguide us away from the truths of this book so church benefits abound when we simply take the time to study read and apply the one book that is completely trustworthy why then do we pay so little attention to studying this book and we pay so much attention to human reason to our emotions, to traditions, and to our culture, when all we need is found here. 
And then lastly, I just want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about what we followed up on last week. A head full of Bible knowledge without putting it into practice has no benefits. A head full of Bible knowledge without putting it into practice has no benefits whatsoever. I'm familiar with a person that I was involved with years ago. This person loved Jesus. This person was a committed believer. This person walked closely with the Lord. This person personally went to three, four, and five spiritual life conferences, uh, leadership conferences, to better their walk with God, to deepen their relationship with God. They went to three and four of those a year. And you know what this person's activity was in the church? Zero. Oh man, he, he could quote stuff, he could discern things, and he could point out where your theology was wrong. He could point out what, what you could, the steps you could take to make your marriage better. He could point out many biblical truths. But he put none of that into practice. He was a fat, not physically. Spiritually, he was fat. Spiritually, he was sour, and spiritually, he was judgmental. That's what a head full of Bible knowledge will do without application. I said it last week, I'll say it again this week. I would rather you learn one verse of the Bible and live out that one verse than be able to teach a seminary class. See, that's what's wrong with seminary classes. Not that I'm knocking higher education in any way, shape, or form. I love my seminary education. But I'll tell you this. Most of the guys that taught me how to preach haven't stood in front of a congregation for decades. Most of the guys that taught me how to deal with interpersonal church, re church relationships, they hadn't done that for decades. They were still teaching and talking off of notes. So, again, head knowledge is a wonderful thing, but head knowledge plus application is truly what we need. And again, Matthew 7, 24, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. James 1, keep putting into practice all that you've learned and received from me. And then... Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. We have to practice what we learn. We have to take what we study and implement into our lives. So let's move on, talk a little bit about attitude here. Um, so maybe this whole idea of personal Bible study, and what we're talking about is personal Bible study. Not talking about ladies' group, not talking about men's group, not talking about Sunday morning, talking about your personal Bible study. And again, I'm not even going to say you have to do this every day. You do this a couple times a week, yeah, that's a great step. If you do it every day, that's wonderful. If you got that kind of time, you don't have any restraints, studying God's Word uh, purposely every day is a great thing. But if you can do it, study it purposely and in depth a couple times a week, I think that's amazing. So what I don't want this to be is one more thing to add to your Christian checklist. One more thing for you to check on that box of the Christian to-do list. Or I don't want you to sit here, now how in God's name am I going to fit this into everything else that I have to do each day? After all, I'm reading the daily bread. Well, daily bread is a wonderful devotional. The Lenten book is a devotional book. What does that mean? These are very short stories that have wonderful spiritual application. They are uplifting. They can be challenging. It's spiritual thoughts. It's spiritual quotes and quips that get you started for the day. You know, if you're going sit, to sit in the restroom, read the daily bread. You know, if, you, if you're going to, you know, sit there and watch TV, at least turn the sound off during the commercial and read the Lent devotional. See, they're, they're 
short, sweet things that bring a positive word for your day. This is not intense Bible study. This is not paper and pen and Bible kind of Bible study. These are good. I encourage them. I give devotionals to the leadership every year because I'm a believer in devotionals. But this does not substitute the in-depth study of Scripture. So, let's move on. Again, the Bible is often referred to as seed in Scripture. The Bible is referred to as seed. So what I want to do is I want to take the story, and you can turn to Luke chapter 8. I want to take Luke chapter 8 real quick and go through that. Because typically what we do with Luke chapter 8 is we apply this passage to salvation. The Word of God falls on the hard soil. The Word of God falls on the uh, uh, soil with weeds. The Word of God falls onto the rocky soil. And what we do generally is we make the application about salvation. Well, let me say this. That may not be an absolute. What I want to do this morning is present to you that I believe the soils in Luke chapter 8 are the conditions of a heart, but they're the condition of a believer's heart. They're the condition of a believer's heart. So in one day, I could have a hard heart, I could have a rocky heart, I could have a heart with weeds in it, or I could have a fertile soil. So let's start real quick. Luke chapter 8, verses 4 to 8. Read with me. Luke chapter 8, verse 4. One day Jesus told a story in the form of a parable to a large crowd that had gathered from many towns to hear him. A farmer went out to plant his seed as he scattered it across the field. Some fell on the footpath where it was stepped on and the birds ate it. Other seed fell among the rocks. It began to grow, but soon the plant wilted and died for lack of moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns. It grew up and it was choked out by the tender plants. Still other seed fell on fertile soil. The seed grew up, produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as had been planted when he had said this he called out anyone who has hears let him hear so let me apply this to my heart as a believer to your heart as a believer okay believe it or not many christians have a closed mind in spite of being christians many christians close their mind to certain things in spite of what the bible says many christians wrestle with having a closed mind i've had a closed mind when it comes to scripture especially when it tells me what i don't like i close my mind off so believe it or not every one of us have and probably have in the past the capability to ignore what we read in scripture and you know what happens when we ignore what we read in Scripture? That's a hard heart. We can follow Jesus and still have a hard heart when it comes to the teaching of Scripture, when it comes to the seed of God's Word. Yes, some days your pastor's heart is hard. And I read something in Scripture and it says, treat your wife well and I don't want to. And I'm not going to do that today. Thankfully, thankfully, the Holy Spirit convicts me, I confess that is sin, and I treat my wife properly. You see, in order to combat this bad attitude, and that's what we're talking about, these attitudes of the heart, in order to combat that, you and I have to cultivate an open mind to be open to the truth of this word. It's trustworthy, it's a light, it's a lamp. It's good for me. It keeps me on the straight and narrow. Your word I've hid in my heart so I won't sin against you. I've got to stop being stubborn when it comes to reading God's word and applying it to my life. Secondly, we have the superficial mind. Other seed fell among rocks. It began to grow, but soon the plant wilted and died for lack of moisture. This means that we hear and embrace what God is saying, but it never sinks in. It's sort of superficial. It's like trying to remember what you had for dinner Thursday. I know I ate. You remember what you had for dinner Thursday? It's superficial. Now, some of you probably do, and God bless you, but for the rest of us, us normal beings. You see, it's superficial. So we can take the Word of God, we can study it, and it sinks in, and we go, oh, yeah, 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 and then it kind of fades away. In this case, we need to be fully present in the moment. Fully present when we eat, or when we read. <laughs> yeah, we need to be fully present when we eat too. Yeah, that too. But glancing at Scripture 
or trying to do your Bible study with Sports Center on doesn't work. It becomes superficial. Thirdly, is the soil with the weeds. And that's a preoccupied mind. Other, uh, other seed fell among the thorns. It grew up and choked out the tender plants. This is the distracted mind. This is where I live. A squirrel. Oh, look, the sun's out. Oh, look, now it's raining. Oh, look, now it's snow. I, to be distracted? Man, that's my thing. You see? But what we have to do is to study and what we have to do is to embrace it we have to take what god tells us and then meditate on it we'll talk about that in a few weeks meditating on god's word god i love what you told me but i got to get going because i got stuff to do god i got to get the kids bathed i got to do the help them with their home you know the truth of god word sinks in but we're so busy that it doesn't take root. We're so busy that the distractions cause us to forget what we've embraced. And then lastly, there's the good soil. Other seed fell on fertile soil. This seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as what been planted. This is the open mind. This is when you and I fully are in the moment, when we're fully embracing the truth of God's word, when we put that application into our life. Here I am, Lord, teach me, our minds soaking it up, putting it into practice on a day-to-day -day basis. This leads to a vibrant kingdom faith. So my prayer for all of us is to embrace personal Bible study. Again, remember, it's not the same as reading the Bible. My prayer is that we make personal Bible study a priority. To be honest, personal Bible study is an expected part of every believer's lifestyle it's just expected it's part of our dna so all of these verses we've looked at none of them are suggestions none of them are optional they're put forth by god himself so what's our next steps just remind you it's not how you do bible study it's that you do Bible study. Whatever works for you, make it work for you. Just do it. If you're doing Bible study, God bless you. Keep on, embrace it, dig deeper, and apply it day after day into your life. If you don't do Bible study yet, sit down, make it a priority. Ask God to help you carve time into your day so that you might make that a regular practice. Father, thank you. Worship team, why don't you come up? Those that are going to serve communion, you can join me as well. Father, here we are this morning. Lord, we've heard much about the goodness of your word. Father, we've heard much about the benefits of your word. And God, as obedient sons and daughters, we want to apply. We not only want to apply your word, but we want to understand it clearly. So God, would you challenge us to do a better job at personal Bible study? God, would you motivate us to make time for personal Bible study? God, would you challenge us to make Bible study a priority? Lord, now as we move to communion, would you open our hearts and minds to the truth Father, of this simple but yet very important ceremony of communion. Father, thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Here at Community Church, <coughs> communion is open communion. And that simply means this, that if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, this meal is for you not for the members of community church it's not a meal for your small children to pacify them in the next few minutes this is something important and symbolic and i'm going to talk about that in a few moments but in first corinthians chapter 11 we have the most famous reading of the communion and paul is writing to the church at corinth about communion he wasn't there in the upper room on that Thursday night when Jesus ate the Passover meal 
with his disciples. This was conveyed to Paul through divine revelation. It was Jesus and the twelve in the upper room, and they were celebrating the Passover. And the Passover was about the children of Israel being released from Egypt as captives. God had sent Moses, and Moses had told the people of Israel, he says, tomorrow we're going to leave the captivity of Egypt. And he says, so tonight you go home and you eat a good meal. You eat a meal with your family. You eat a lamb's, you eat a lamb dinner. And what you do is when you kill and slaughter that lamb, you take some of the blood and you put the blood of the lamb on your doorpost. Because tonight, the death angel from God is going to come. And the death angel from God is going to strike dead the firstborn male in every home that is not covered by the blood. So as the Jews marked their houses with the blood of the Lamb, the death angel passed over the Israelite homes and they were spared. But their neighbors, the Egyptians, who did not know anything about the death angel coming, who did not know anything about what God was about to do, they lost their firstborn. Not just the firstborn of their sons, but the firstborn of all their flock. And so Jesus, sitting with his disciples in the upper room, in the middle of the meal that was celebrating this Passover from days of old when the children of Israel were captives in Egypt, Jesus said, from now on, this meal is not about the Passover when Israel left Egypt. From now on, this meal is is about the Lamb of God. From now on, this meal is about the blood of the Savior. So this blood that will be shed for you and the world tomorrow, it will bring salvation. Jesus changed, literally changed Israel's history. We're no longer going to do this traditional Passover. Jesus said, from this point on, it's going to be about me. And it's going to be about salvation that comes through my blood. Not the blood of a lamb, not the blood of a goat, but through my blood. So as they pass out the elements, would you take a bread, take a cup, hold on to it, and in a few moments we'll finish the story.